We're going to discuss the notion of continuity now. So a function f is called continuous. at a if the limit as x tends to a of f of x is equal to f of a. Uh, sometimes the domain of definition forces us to, to consider uh, a one-sided limit. So for example, uh, if we have a function f uh, defined from on a uh, closed interval from a, b with values in r, so its graph will look something like this, right? So you have A and you have B. Then uh, we will say that F is continuous at A if the limit as x tends to a from the right of f of x equal to f of a. This is because the function is not defined on the left. Actually, one uh, might even write simply the limit as x tends to a, uh, implying that uh, only uh, the part on the right is going to uh, be under consideration. And similarly, we can say that uh, f is continuous at b if uh, the limit as x tends to be from the left of f of x equal to f of b. And for all other points in between, we just use the definition that we gave above. So in general, f is continuous on i, usually that is going to be an interval or sometimes a union of intervals. If it is continuous at every point of i. To understand better the notion of continuity, we can ask our, ourselves, what does it mean for a function not to be continuous? In fact, the term that we use here is discontinuous. And imagine something like this. So you have the uh, point A and F of A is right here. But you can clearly see here that uh, the limit as X tends to A from the right of F of X, which is this number actually, is different from the limit as X tends to A uh, from the left. And that is uh, which actually happens to be equal to A. So in other words, uh, we can say, for example, th this is, by the way, called jump discontinuity when the one-sided limits exist, uh, but are different from each other. So it's called jump discontinuity. And uh, in general, uh, F is continuous at A. assuming it's defined on both sides of A, uh, if and only if the limit as x tends to A of f of x from the right is equal to the limit as x tends to A from the left of f of x, and that equals f of A. So um, we would like now to uh, give a, um, an interesting example of, actually, let's give one more type of discontinuity. Uh, imagine this situation. This function could have been continuous, but somebody actually went and spoiled it at this one point. Okay, so here's A and here's F of A. And obviously you can see that uh, the limit as X approach A of, uh, f of x is right here. And that's different from f of a. Uh, here, 
we could actually make the function continuous if we redefined it at a to be equal to its limit. And this type of discontinuity is called a, um, a removable discontinuity because by changing the function at uh, just one point, we can remove the discontinuity. And then uh, we have other types of uh, discontinuity. So for example, if you have a function that sort of has an asymptote, let's say at a given point, you can define it at um, the point in between, but the, the function has an asymptote here. Uh, then that's usually called uh, infinite discontinuity. That is, we're going to talk about an infinite discontinuity when one of the one-sided limits, at least one of the one-sided limits is infinity, meaning a function has a um, vertical asymptote at that point. Um, however, it's going to be uh, kind of interesting to look at the first type of discontinuity. And we would like to look at this type of uh, exercise. So example, uh, find A so that the function f of x equals with um, x square plus ax plus one if x is less than or equal to two and x plus three a if x is greater than two is continuous. So what do we have here? Here, in some sense, we're not really looking at just one function. We're looking at infinitely many functions. For each value of a, we have one function. And what is happening here is if we try to sketch the graph of this function, we would see that at two, something very interesting happens. So here, uh, the function is a line on the right. And it's a sort of a parabola on the left. And in general, the uh, Two branches do not meet, meet each other. In fact, you could argue that this will be the limit as x tends to a from the right of f of x. And this is the limit as x tends to, uh, I'm sorry, not a, the number two actually, of f of x. So the question is, is there any value of a for which actually the two branches uh, meet each other so that the function is actually continuous? And, and the answer is yes. Uh, let's see how we find that. And we have to be careful how we uh, express this. So uh, for f to be continuous, the only uh, problematic point here is actually the point x equals two. For f to be continuous, uh, we need the limit from the left of f of x to be equal to the limit from the right of f of x. Yes, but for the limit from the left, we have to use the uh, first formula. So x squared plus ax plus one. For the limit from the right, we have to use the uh, other formula. And now the uh, first limit will end up being four plus two a plus one. And that should be equal to two plus three a. And the two numbers should be equal. So when we solve for them, we will find uh, three here a is equal to three. So if a is equal to three, then the function is continuous. Uh, now, we would like to introduce uh, a very uh, important theorem uh, of 
calculus, which is called the intermediate value theorem. Intermediate value theorem can be given in different ways, but I'm going. We're going to give a, a quite simplified, quite simple way, uh, simple version of it. So we're going to say that uh, if uh, f of x is continuous. on the closed interval a, b, and f of a times f of b is less than zero. What, what this really means is that the two numbers, the two outputs are, have opposite signs. Then there exists c in the closed interval a, b, such that uh, f of c is equal to zero. Uh, we have to understand what this means. So you have a function which on the left has a negative value and on the right has a positive value. Uh, this means at a and at b. Uh, it could also be the other way around. Bottom line is that uh, the two values at the endpoints, the two outputs at the endpoints, have opposite signs, and it's continuous in between. And basically, what we're saying is that that uh, the only way a continuous function can actually go from uh, a point below the x-axis to a point above the x-axis, or vice vice versa, is if it intersects somewhere in between the um, x-axis. It, it might intersect the x-axis at more than one point, but we actually um, here just going to use the fact that uh, it will be just one point at which it intersects uh, the x-axis. And we call that number c. And the interesting thing is that uh, the, the theorem itself gives us the existence of this number c without uh, and in general, we're not going to be able to determine what this is. We will just know that it is there. So let's look at an example. Examples show that uh, the equation x to the third is equal to x plus one has a real solution. Now, how is that relate? How does that relate to the intermediate value theorem? The, the idea actually is pretty simple. Uh, we bring everything to the left hand side. So uh, the equation is equivalent to x cubed minus x minus one is equal to zero. So we define uh, f of x to be x cubed minus x minus one. Now, the, the interesting thing is that we need to choose two numbers so that the outputs at those two numbers uh, have opposite sign. So we can always start with zero, which gives us a negative number, and then ask ourselves, uh, how far do we need to go in order to get a um, positive output? And it turns out that if we take f of two, that should be sufficient because we get eight minus two, that six minus one is five. So uh, by the intermediate value theory, uh, there is C. Uh, actually, if I go back, the, the C that uh, the intermediate value theorem gives us obviously belongs at uh, belongs to the closed interval, but it is traditional to to actually write that C belongs to the open interval. So let me change this up here 
even though it was not uh, it's technically it's not a mistake but uh, that's that's how traditionally the uh, theorem is given so there is a c in the open interval from zero to two uh, such that uh, f of c is equal to zero uh, such a c is a solution uh, to the initial equation. And yes, it's a good idea to actually give this brief description of the steps that we take here. Uh, let's do another example so that we can see how these uh, steps are taken once more. So, uh, show that there is a real number x uh, that equals its own cosine. Okay, so what do we need to do here? So uh, in other words, We need to show that the equation uh, cosine x equals x as a real solution. This equivalent. to cosine x minus x is equal to zero. So we define uh, f of x to be cosine x minus x, which is continuous. Uh, so it's, it's actually important to mention that the function is continuous. So let me go back to the previous example and actually uh, add this. Because if the function that you're looking at is not continuous as required by the intermediate value theorem, then uh, one may not apply the intermediate value theorem. So we need to actually mention that the function is continuous. And then we just need to find, so let's start with f of zero. What is f of zero? Cosine of zero is one minus zero. And then um, if we're looking for something which is pretty straightforward, let's take f of pi, you will get cosine pi minus pi. Cosine of pi is negative one. There is no doubt that this number is negative, whereas this number is positive. So by the intermediate value theory, there is C in the interval from zero to pi, such that F of C is zero. Such a C is a solution to our initial equation. And that's it. Thanks for watching.